Why couldn't James get very good footage of the claret? Why? Because he couldn't get the focus right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mark here again from Cosmic Audio. Thanks for the comments and uh, messages and loads of stuff we've had from you over the past week or so on the videos we've been uploading. Uh, that's very encouraging, so we'll keep going. We'll keep doing some more. If there's anything you want to see, then please let us know. If there's anything you'd like to know about, uh, then give us a shout. Let us know what you'd like to see, and we'll try our very best to do it. Um, we've had lots of people saying that they really enjoyed the recording the jazz trio video can we do some more kinds of stuff like that so i thought as we'd as our kind of specialist thing here is is live band recording um i mean we do sort of album tracking and stuff like that but i'm not the kind of person that likes to spend 10 days getting a bass drum sound where i just get incredibly bored and think by the time you've got the sound right and been through 25 different microphones the drummer's forgotten what he was going to play in the first place and everyone's bored and they've all gone off to smoke weed or whatever um so i like to get a band in uh, mic everyone up get the vibe going get a performance going um we do a lot of video work as well as audio work so it's great to sort of video everything and then the band have got something really useful they can put on their social media um, and such was the case with the wonderful emily francis trio who we recorded in august of last year we've worked with emily before um, both with her trio, we did a, a, a video shoot for them at a gig at Colchester Arts Centre in 2018. We also worked with Emily, um, she's a keyboard player in the Katie Bush Band, and she called last year and said, could we come up and do a video? And I was like, yes, 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 because Emily is brilliant. She's one of those keyboard players that she's got the knowledge there, she's got the education, she, you know, she knows what she's doing, but she's really got her own sound and she's a really emotional player. Um, she's, she's, when she's doing the, the Katie Bush stuff, she can just play a single chord on a piano and I'm in tears. It's, I don't know how she does it. It's, it's incredible. She's a really good player. Um, so it's great to hear someone that's got the, you know, the, the education and the, and the theory behind them, but can also put their own personality on it and, and really have their own sound. Um, and that's great. We get a lot of musicians come through that have, been you know very well educated um <clears throat> and a lot of them kind of sound a little bit the same but then what tends to happen is a, a year or two down the line a f small percent sort of start to develop their own sound and then if you hear something on the radio and you go i i know who played sax on that um without actually knowing who played sax on that then that's great if you can tell someone's playing just by hearing them on the radio then that's fantastic and emily's got that she's got her own unique sound which is great so it's a fairly simple setup um it's the emily francis trio so there's three of them funnily enough um emily on keys uh jamie on drums and trevor on bass um it was kind of st it's not jazz jazz it's probably more uh, it's more prog rock, really, very fusion-y than, than jazz. So it's not like the video we did the other day on the Michael Horner trio, which was, you know, traditional jazz playing a standard. Um, it's not that kind of jazz. It's more of a, a an edgy kind of fusion-y jazz, definitely very prog-inspired. Um, where's that music coming from? <laughs> Oh, my pocket. <laughs> well, that's, let's just have a little listen to this a minute, shall we? <laughs> I can hear music coming from somewhere. It's coming out my pocket. My phone's just suddenly started to uh, play this. It's quite good. It's a uh, Daffy D. E. Garag when. And it's a bit of Bryn Turfle there for you. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> great. I don't know why my, my um, bum suddenly decided to play that, but it did. Anyway, where were we? Yes, so it's a jazz trio, but it's not jazz jazz. It's, it's you know, it's, it's fusion-y, 
um, prog inspired jazz. So for the drums, we went for a more rock approach than we did with with the Michael Horner trio, which was a more of a natural sounding kind of jazz approach. Um, kick in, kick out. Let's just go through the channels. AKG D112 on the kick in. Uh, our MXL butchered U47 clone type thing on the outside of the kick. On the top of the snare, we had, what did we have on the snare? Was it an i5 or an SM57? An Audix i5 on the on the snare top, uh, snare bottom. Nothing. I don't often use a snare bottom mic. A lot of people do. Um, I don't often use it unless we're really going for a very super tight kind of isolated drums kind of sound. I don't tend to use a bottom mic an awful lot on the snare because, or a hi hat mic because generally when I do, I never use it. Um, and then I, when I don't use it, I don't think, oh, I wish I'd used that. There's never really been a situation where I haven't used one and gone, oh, I wish I'd put a snare under the, or I wish I'd put a mic under the snare. I prefer to try and get a more natural sound from the overheads. Um, I mean, how many times do you go to a gig and see a band and lay on the floor with your head under the snare? You don't, do you? It's not a very natural sound to me, so I don't tend to bother micing it. But you could also argue how many times you go to a gig and lean on the floor, Tom. Uh, you don't, so why mic with floor tom? Well, yeah, so there's fours and against, but I generally don't tend to bother uh, mic in the bottom of a snare unless it's for a um, you know a bigger budget recording where we've got a lot of time to do the tracking, in which case I will, because then obviously if it's there, you don't have to use it. Uh, but if it's not there and you wish you'd done it, then it's not there. Um, so it depends on the depends on the project. But generally for live stuff, as a rule, I won't I won't bother um, and didn't in this case. Um, on the tom, just one tom, floor tom, um, we had, I was going to go for dynamic, but we didn't. In, in this, a dynamic didn't sound quite right. We needed something a bit more open sounding. Um, so I went for one of these. Now this is quite an unusual microphone in that it's a condenser microphone. Um, and there's normally, the condenser microphones, you normally have a small diaphragm condenser, which is the pencil type or a large diaphragm condenser. Um, and this is in the middle. This is a medium diaphragm condenser. So small diaphragm condensers tend to be 12 mil on the actual capsule size or under, whereas large are 25 or an inch capsule. Um, and this has got an 18 mil capsule. So it's kind of in between. The capsule is also unusual in this in that it's aluminium rather than gold sputtered mylar or what, what you know, whatever's traditionally used in the large diaphragm condensers it's got an aluminium capsule in it so it kind of gives it a unique sound it's a very natural sound we've used these on strings we've used them uh, only this week on a choir uh, they're very good on woodwind anything where you want a fairly natural sound lots of sparkly top end these are absolutely great uh, so that's what we used on the tom overheads we used the small diaphragm condensers um, base we di'd the base um, thought there was something missing there was just a lovely warm sound coming from from trev's bass cab so we we put a mic up on the bass cab as well just a cardioid large diaphragm condenser and just placed it you'll hear this we'll, we'll go through and i'll show you the spill that we got and stuff like that there's no spill we, if you position the mics carefully you can have all the musicians in the same room no one needs to wear headphones if you're doing a video shoot and um there's nothing worse than you know seeing a load of musicians sitting there with headphones on it's like uh, and i personally hate tracking with headphones because i always feel really detached um i can't use any monitors on stage either because i just feel like i'm listening to an ipod rather than you know the, the guys and girls i'm playing with um so we mic the bass amp and then emily's keys she had a Wurlitzer uh, ep200 and a Profit 6, um, both of which di were DI'd. So the Wurlitzer, we DI'd. Um, we were talking on the video we did the other day with the Michael Horner trio. Um, I was saying, should you should you leave reverb on your amp? Should you, if you play through a delay pedal, should you leave the delay on or should you record everything dry and then add it afterwards? And this is a perfect example of when you should leave all that on because emily had a modulation pedal she got mooga fuga on there um she's got lots of different effects going on on the whirly and those effects were affecting the way that she played she she performed differently having those effects on than she would have done if we'd have recorded everything dry and then added them afterwards so that that's how you make your decision if you're 
a guitarist and you're playing the guitar and you're thinking, oh, did I, should I have a slap back delay on this? Or should I have a slightly longer delay? Or should I have a big re... Mm, not quite sure, then leave it off. You can add that afterwards. Whereas if you're playing with a delay that's set to the tempo of the music and that's the, and those delays are becoming part of your solo and it's, it, it's, it's an all-encompassing thing, then leave the de delay on. Um, I'm having trouble with my mouth today. Words aren't coming out properly. Leave the delay on. Um, and you know that's that if it affects your performance then then by all means leave it on uh so that's good and that's basically it three people because it's a trio funnily enough so that's all the instruments um let's have a little look oh one other thing as well was that um when we did the three top tips for recording drum video um i said that the most important thing is the drummer um and jamie turned up with what can really only be described as a load of crap the symbols were cheap budget symbols that were broken um it literally could someone could have hammered out some saucepan lids five minutes before he started playing and they would have done even paper plates or something like that he, he could have used and when he was putting the symbols up we looked at the symbols and it was like hmm okay um just cracked bits missing chunks missing out of them but it's Jamie, and Jamie is a fantastic drummer. He's an absolutely incredible drummer. So he just got behind the kit, just went, uh, uh, yeah, that's all right, move that a bit, brilliant. And, and poof, that was it, that's your drum sound. So the most important thing is the drummer, and then the second most important thing is what they're hitting, and then the third most important thing is the room that you're recording it in, and then really nothing else matters. You can use, budget microphones you can use expensive microphones you if you go out and spend three thousand pounds on a stereo pair of neve preamps and then wonder why your overheads don't have all this extra sparkle or a, a mojo that you were missing before it's nothing to do with the mic preamp or what you're plugging into it and everything to do with the performer and the drum kit and the room you can mic up a rubbish drummer with literally you could you could put an xlr adapter on a pair of apple earbuds and hang them over the kit of a good drummer and it would sound incredible um uh, or you could spend you know hundreds of thousands of pounds on high-end microphones and preamps and put them and mic up a rubbish drummer on a really good kit and then wonder why you've got a crap drum sound drummer um room and 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 the kit that they're the most important things particularly the drummer so this again is a perfect example of that jamie was probably playing about 20 quids worth of cymbals um if if that and it, and it sounds amazing he's he's just great so let's have a little look at what we've got going on we'll solo some mics um a couple of you said that when i soloed stuff before i didn't actually give you a chance to listen to anything because i was waffling on too much so i'll try and take that into account today and shut up a bit um, i'll play you a bit of the whole track first Okay, so let's let's solo some stuff. This is the kick in. So that's the D112. Um, about six inches or so inside the drum, about six inches or so from the from the front head, from the head that's actually been hit with the pedal. Uh, so listen to the kick out. So you can hear we've got a bit of spill there, but it doesn't matter too much. Both together. That's kick in and kick out. And the drums are about to stop, so let's just move it on a bit. Okay, so have a listen to the snare. So again, quite heavily gated, like we did with the video we did with Roger the other day. Um, the snare is quite heavily gated on this and it's also triggered as well. So it's triggering a sample. Let me put the sample in and you'll hear that. So it's a, it's a, it was, I thought it was missing some of that splat. Um, so when we were mixing it, we just added a sample in over the top. Let's solo the snare with the kick. And let's bring the overheads in. And the bottom. So that's the entire drum sound. Uh, very simple setup, two mics on the kick, one on the snare. Um, 
listen to that floor tom that's that that these mics sound great on toms again the toms fairly heavily gated on this let's just solo that and we can have a listen to the floor tom let's just go to a bit where he's playing it so in with everything else it's just a great tom sound a bit of reverb on there just a bit of sort of ambient reverb and Jamie really went nuts at the end of this track as well. He's, it's like each limb is playing something in a completely different time signature. It's just incredible. Uh, and the cymbals sound great. I mean, they're rubbish cymbals, really rubbish cymbals. And they sound great because he's playing them. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Uh, let's solo the bass. Here we go. A bit further into the track, so we've got so this is the DI, so it's just a really clean signal, not particularly inspiring. It's a DI bass at the end of the day, which is why we chose to add the, the microphone in rather than going for any kind of amp simulation or something like this. Now, listen, listen to what careful mic positioning can do. So, listen to the spill we're getting from the, the bass microphone. I'll solo just the bass mic. That's again, it was like the the sax on the Michael Horner trio, it might as well have been recorded in a different room. If you position your mics carefully and you've got uh, our live room, we designed to be fairly dead because it wasn't, it's not big enough to sound great. Um, so we decided to design it so it doesn't have a sound at all. It's very dead. There's a quite a bit of diffusion in there, but just so you don't go mad when you're in there for hours at a time and you're having a conversation and it doesn't suck all the all the life out of your voice. So there's some reflection in the room, um, but in the sort of critical areas, it's 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 super dead, um, and that that proves it. So we had the mic pointing away with its with its bum end. So cardioid microphone, you pick up pattern uh, goes out the front of the microphone like that and at the back of the microphone you get very little sound the sound goes in but it's not picked up from the back of the microphone um, so you know you point that towards your drums and then you you get minimal spill coming from that um, again Emily wasn't wearing headphones her so even though we we DI'd her keys she had a monitor in the room and she was listening through the monitor um, and we're not even getting any of that in the bass mic at all so that with the DI you get a nice full bass sound let's just pop the drums in with that as well so as I said Emily and Trevor came up um, after the the uh, tracking day and after we did the video shoot um, and we spent a day in here and just went through the mix on, on both the songs to get it. They, they came up with, the, they did exactly what you should do. They came up with some reference tracks and said, we want it to sound a bit like this. I'd have listened to the tracks and was like, oh yeah, great. Well, you kind of sound like that anyway. So um, it was just kind of, you know, little tweaks, but that's great when a band come in and they go, we want to sound like this or we want to sound like that, but you know, while still being, being us. Um, they had a very clear idea of how they wanted everything to sound. Um, and we got there, so that's always good. Um, okay, that's that. Let's have a little listen to the keys. So, Emily's Whirly is really gnarled up with some of the effects she was using, which is great. It's almost just like it's going through a really, really out of shape tape machine. <laughs> So again, it's just a DI from the output of the, the last effects pedal she was using. And we've just put a bit of reverb on it. This end. Um, and then the Profit, which is adding um, some nice, lovely synthness at the end. With the whirly over the top, just a great sound. Let's put everything in together. There we go, the computer's struggling to 
replay everything and record the screen capture video as well. So you might be hearing a couple of dropouts there. That's our um, poor little old Mac going, oh, stop the suffering. So again, we'll play, we'll play the whole video um, at the end of this. Let's just really quickly go through the mix because there's not much to go through. Um, the drums, I did pretty much what we did with the Michael Horner stuff. Um, slight bit of compression on the kick. Let's just play a bit. So not much, just a dB or two coming off there. Um, boosted this, I normally boost the bass drum at around 50 to 60 hertz. Um, this one's a little bit higher. Um, this one I actually boosted at 70 because that's where it sounded. That's where it sounded best. Oh yeah, here we go, Mac struggling. Now now graphics are appearing. Um, so let's just let's just stop that and I'll just go through and show you roughly what we've done. So there's a slight boost there. Um, cut at 3.5k because 3.5k is generally a horrible sound on drums. It can sound just yuck. So I quite often notch out a little bit of 3.5k. Uh, that's the kick in. Kick out, similar story. So tiny little bit of compression. Again, a slight boost, this time at 60 um nothing else on there and again with the SSE, ssl eq a slight boost at 50 um and then a slight boost in the high mids at around 5k just to bring a little bit of the snap out uh snare so again standard fare gate on the snare there little boost at 3.2 high shelf bit of a boost there um little bit of a cut at what's that said at 1.19 so 1.2 a little bit of a cut and then a booster around 100 just to give a put a bit of the body into it a little bit of compression and then some shimmer and some thickness from the revival plugin so pretty much what we did with uh with roger's kit the other day um floor tom is again a gate a um, little bit of eq a little bit of compression um so we've bought out some six and a half K there and a bit of a cut at 560 um, and then a little bit of a boost at around 130 just to bring some of the nice low end out of the floor tom uh, that's that overheads just tiny bit of compression and a little tiny little bit of sparkle on the top and again a bit of a cut um, uh, what's that for 1k near enough and a little bit of a cut at 100 just to get it get the drums sitting in nicely with the, or the overhead sitting in nicely with the close mics and that's it bass you can see i did absolutely nothing to the bass at all no compression no eq just the combined di and amp sound sounded great so we left it alone nothing to do there trevor certainly didn't need any compression he's a very even um very good player so um, nothing there to iron out or, or anything it, that's fairly easy with the whirly i don't think we did much no hardly anything so again bit of compression <coughs> excuse me a uh, little bit of a boost at just over 3k a little bit of a boost at one and a half k and that's it um, and then we just put it through the um the london virtual tube thing just to gnarl it up a bit and give it a little bit more edge a little bit more aggression on there it's just like a, a kind of drive plug in to 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 give it a bit of extra oomph let's just solo that if the computer will allow me and we can do a bypass so you can hear what it's doing so there's the whirly once it gets going a bit more aggressively so it's quite a It's quite a gnarly sound. So if we take the plugins off, you can see it's still quite a gnarly sound, um, which is great. That's what exactly what Emily wanted. So that's just get the, the processing, just really bringing it to life and giving it a little bit of thickness and a little bit of distortion with the with the extra plugins there. Back to the whole track. Drums. 
driving it's mental so that's it really there's not much else to say on that one um great band great performance and that's what it's all about if you've got a great band and a great performance then as i said the other day you can literally mic them up with anything um and as long as you're not doing anything technically wrong then um you know fantastic you don't need to get the tape measure out and measure how far the bass amp is from the hi-hat and then start aligning channels to try and get everything in phase and all that malarkey mic everything up listen to it if it sounds good it is good if it doesn't sound good then work out why it doesn't sound good um, it probably won't be what kind of microphone you're using on it it might be where you've put the microphone or it might be the actual instrument itself but if it sounds good then it is good um, so don't get too hung up on the technicalities when especially when you're starting out um, get the basics right don't go out and spend three thousand pounds on a preamp thinking that's the answer to everything it really isn't um, you can use the preamps in any decent modern interface these days and they'll be fine everything we record in this studio um, goes through the presonus preamps in this desk there's a remote stage box in the live room which is connected to this with a cat5 cable which means we get zero latency monitoring monitoring we can do everything on faders super easy the preamps are great they're not fantastic um, you could get quieter preamps with a bit more headroom but there, you know, there's 32 of them, um, and they all sound the same. So you, you already you're starting to get a sort of harmonious recording that's easier to mix because all the mics are going through the same preamps. We've got the Focusrite Claret there as well, which we'll use on a more sensitive recording. When we, if it's if it's quieter, when we were recording the choir the other night, we used the Claret just because the the preamps are a little bit quieter. They've got a tiny bit more headroom, um, but the, you know, there's really not much in it. I'd have been quite happy to use this, but we, we took the claret just because it's that little bit quieter and we weren't sure how loud or, or quiet what the dynamics of the choir were going to be. Um, but yeah, so that's the advice. Stick your mics up in front of your drummer or your guitarist or your piano player. Um, and as long as you're using the right kind of microphone on the right source um, and you're going through a decent interface into a computer, if it sounds awful, it's probably not the fault of the equipment. It's probably something you're doing or it might be down to the performer. So you need to go back and, and, and iron that out and not sort of try and fix it with technology, fix it with actual you know, the real, the, the real thing, what, what the, find out what the problem is and then take it from there. So we'll do another video on different types of microphone and what type of microphone you should use on what type of instrument and when. So already you can see that we've used this week, we've used dynamics on a tom, but we've also used condensers on a tom, when you'd use a dynamic, when you'd use a condenser, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, someone messaged me and said, when would you use a small diaphragm condenser versus a large diaphragm condenser? So we'll do a video on microphones and types and, and things like that. And a few of you have also messaged me and um, said, what sample rate do we record at? We record everything at 48 kilohertz, 24 bit, 48 kilohertz, uh, never record at 96. Um, and there's technical reasons for that. Um, so I'm gonna, also gonna do a video on sample rates and try and demystify some of the, the sort of snake oil surrounding those. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, we'll leave you with the fabulous Emily Francis trio and see you in the next video. Cheers, bye. Thank you.
Thank you.